Hello everyone, it's Sarah the Tudor Travel Guide here and welcome to today's Tudor Talk with our very special guest Tracy Borman. And I'm going to be talking to Tracy in a moment. But first of all, let me just say for those of you who don't know me, Yes, I'm Sarah and I'm the founder of the Tudor Travel Guide, which is a blog dedicated to being your visitor's companion to the houses and castles and manors of the 16th century. So as ever, folks, just before we dive into the meat of our call today, and I have Tracy waiting and anxious to take your questions, I just want to get the thumbs up from you guys to know that you can hear me okay and I can already see some people arriving, so let's see who's in the house here. Okay, we'll just bring in Helen. Hi, Helen. So Helen is joining us um, from Upper Norwood in London. Okay, and um, we've already got a question from Helen, so maybe we'll come back to that in a moment. And Susan's in the house. Hi, Susan. Lovely to see you from Pennsylvania. And um, Beverly there. Hello, Beverly. You're in Lincoln. Uh, who else have we got? We've got, is it Maya? Lovely to see you, Maya. And the lovely Monica from Italy. Great to see you, Monica. And Anna, hi. Oh, we are off. We are off indeed. This is always such a special one when we have chance to talk to a guest. Okay, is anybody having, okay. Is anybody having sound problems? That's that's from Susan. Um, Loud and clear here in Cambridgeshire incredible bruce hello and liz from miami in florida wow it's great to see all you guys it looks like overall people can hear and see me so that's fantastic and thank you for saying hello so i hope you have some questions for tracy uh, we'll be coming to those soon and i'm going to try and ask as many as i can we have Tracy for about an hour today, so let's try and cram in as much um, Tudor and Stuart as it happens. Goodness today. So without further ado, let me introduce our guest. So um, now many of you will know Tracy, of course, from her time in the Tudor sphere. And Tracy is the joint curator at Historic Royal Palaces and also the chief executive of the Heritage Education Trust. And I know many of you will have enjoyed Tracy's uh, non-fiction books such as Henry VIII and the, the Men Who Made Him and of course, course Thomas Cromwell, the untold story of Henry VIII's most faithful servant and the private lives of the Tudors. But of course uh, Tracy is also known for her talented fiction writing and of course that's what we are here to talk about today. So um, Tracy has been writing her trilogy, so I hope you can see this on the screen, her Francis Georges trilogy, uh, The King's Witch, The Devil's Slave, and I believe shortly to be released, The Fallen Angel, which I know many of you are eagerly looking forward to. And that's what we're going to be wrapping today's conversation around. So uh, if you've been reading the books or you want to know more about them, now is the time to ask Tracy your questions. And I'm sure if you wanted to ask any other little bits and pieces about Tracy's work as a, as a historian and curator at one of the most amazing Tudor places in the world, then I'm sure she'd be happy to take those too. So, okay. So it, without further ado, I think I'd like to bring in Tracy. So hello, Tracy. Welcome hello. to Tudor Talk. Hello, I'm really delighted to be here. This is very exciting, the wonders of technology. Eh? I know, I know. And I saw your Twitter comments about having been out for a very long bike ride today, but you're looking perfectly groomed I've now. I've washed my hair. I'm all good. <laughs> So guys, keep giving us a thumbs up or the hearts as we go, because and not only that helps me know that you can still hear us okay, and we're not talking to ourselves, but also um, it helps spread the Tudor love as well. And what I'm going to be doing is I've got a, one or two questions for you, Tracy, that I want to ask, but we've already got questions coming in. So um, as you're talking, I may be just scanning down and, and looking for questions. So uh, don't let that put you off. Okay, so now, Perhaps um, 
as I said, I mean, certainly I know you best for your work in the Tudor sphere, as I call it, and all your wonderful non-fiction work that you've done and your appearances um, on the TV inside the Tower of London and and even on University Challenge, which is a little bit separate, but I must say, I want to take this moment to just, just give you my heartfelt congratulations. I was very impressed. The Muppets Christmas Carol, my one and only start of the 10 that I got correct. So yeah, I'll be proud of that for the rest of my life, I go, think. Go girl. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Anyway, so as I say, you're probably best known for your kind of work in the Tudor era and Recently, when you have started writing this trilogy, which begins at the end of the reign of Elizabeth, but of course is is really set in the 17th century. So, so my question was: Have you always been a bit of a Stuart kind of closet fan? Is this an area that you you are also equally interested in? Well, let me uh, say I am first and foremost a Tudor historian slash enthusiast. Um, slash obsessive, actually. Um, and they really are, you know, the beginning and the end for me. I absolutely love the Tudors. But what got me interested in the Stuarts was when I wrote a non-fiction account of the witch hunts, and in particular during the reign of James I. And I just thought, what a dark and fascinating chapter in our history that was. And, and also what a contrast between the Stuart court and the Tudor court. And I thought that actually makes a really good dramatic proposition, a good dramatic theme for fiction. But I sort of just put the idea in my mind and then left it and carried on with nonfiction and then revived it after a few years and, and just thought, actually, I really want to go for this. I'd always wanted to write fiction. And so I stuck with the, the Stuarts uh, rather than uh, the very kind of crowded field that is Tudor fiction. I thought, actually, I'm going to write something Stuart. And I wanted to really bring that terrifying period of our history to life. How interesting. And, and I have to say, I don't know what, what you think about. Was it quite challenging to move into fiction from nonfiction? Because it's a very different way of writing, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. It's so different. And how naive I was, because I read historical fiction all the time. This is like my guilty pleasure when I'm not researching. I read all sorts of historical fiction. I can't get enough of it. So I thought, well, I know, I know how to do this because I read it all the time. So it's easy. Goodness me, it's not easy. It's really, it's such a different discipline to to make stuff up you know you can actually make stuff up it goes against the grain for a historian um but i think increasingly as i got into my stride i could recognize the virtues of it and in particular you know when you get those frustrating gaps in the sources when you're doing non-fiction mm -hmm. and when you get those gaps in fiction you can fill them with your imagination and and i think that's what i really enjoyed um but i learned so much show not tell became my mantra you've got to dramatize you've got to convey information through through scenes and through drama not just say and then this happened as you would in non-fiction so I learned an awful lot but I'm a complete convert now I love writing fiction ah good well maybe we'll come on to future projects at the end and you can give us a little sneaky peek on what's down the line but let's come back to the trilogy can you tell us broadly speaking what is the plot across the three novels Okay, so the three novels, really, they're all set in the reign of James I. So as you say, the first one begins you know, right on the cusp of the, the transition between the, the Tudors and the Stuarts. And the overriding theme, um, really, is the king's obsession with witchcraft. And all three novels uh, follow a, a heroine named Frances Gorges, uh, uh, who Gorges. was a real... Yeah, apparently, because I, I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. She was a real person. She, she actually existed. Um, and I visited um, the current day uh, incumbents of her former home who are descended from her. And they said, if you pronounce it like the River Ganges, it's Gorges. So there you go. Um, and so we know she existed, but we know precious little about her. So she met, she was an ideal heroine for me because I could embroider, embroider all sorts of themes and thoughts and feelings around her and put her in all sorts of situations. Um, but... We do know a few facts about her life. We know, you know, the date of her birth, um, uh, her death, her children and such like. And so I definitely, where, where there was a known fact, I, I kind of weave that into the narrative. Yeah. So really, it's 
The dominant theme is that of the witch hunts, but also with particularly with novel one, it's all about the gunpowder plot and the kind of Catholic underworld of early 17th century England and, you know, this sense of huge disappointment in their new king that he wasn't going to show as much toleration towards Catholics as people hoped. And so religion is a, is another you know major theme in all of this. But goodness me, there are some fantastic characters to go on from the Stuart courts. You know, the, the best ones are not fictional, I would say. <laughs> so you had a lot of material that you could work on and weave in and create some amazing stories. But you said something earlier. I've got so many questions because I really don't know that much about the Stuart at court but you did say something earlier that I'd been wondering and that is you know if you could try and summarize the difference between the Tudor and Stuart mm. court how would it have been different if you'd have been there what would you have noticed felt experienced yeah well I think a complete lack of order and discipline that was the main difference so the Tudors of course they had this splendid court but it was all very carefully controlled. There was a, a strict um, set of rules to being in the Tudor court. And um, the court of Elizabeth I was described by a contemporary as at once gay, decent and superb. And that word decent was really important. You know, no, everybody knew how to behave. That was thrown out the window with the Stuart court. It was just a riot really there was you know depravity debauchery drunkenness and the king had no patience for the kind of elaborate ceremony and etiquette of the tudors and so it was it was much more of a free for all but this led to you know some disquiet um, i think to say the least among his new english subjects who just weren't used to this kind of entertainment and they were deeply shocked by it mm. and they thought greater propriety was called for but the king just liked to have fun and he didn't see the need to keep anything private even though his own um, kind of love life actually uh, perhaps should have been kept private because it was deeply shocking to his subjects so I think that was that was really the main difference you go from this well choreographed court to an absolute free-for-all how extraordinary and yet there was this um as you described the king was deeply puritanical and had clearly yes. very very strong religious views it's I know, he's how does such that a all work he is Honestly, you think you've got him and then he just behaves in a way that you don't expect. And so, yes, um, he is sort of seen as quite puritanical. Um, but at the same time, he loved all of these outrageous masks and he loved to drink. His wife, Queen Anne, was always criticising him for how much he drank and, and predicted it would bring an early death. I think she was sort of hoping it would bring an early death, actually. Um, so, yeah, it's very it's a world of contradictions, the Stuart Court and in particular the king himself. So what happens to your heroine? Can you give us a sense of how she enters the story and, and, and what, what she starts to get embroiled in? Yes. So my heroine is, um, she's a gentleman's uh, daughter. In fact, she was the daughter of um, Helena Snackenborg, another fantastic name. Brilliant. Helena was one of Elizabeth's favourite ladies-in-waiting. So she's born into gentry, um, kind of, you know, fairly well up the social scale. Um, but she is renowned as a healer she is very skilled in herbal remedies. Um, she she grows up in in rural Wiltshire, surrounded by all these these woods and uh, and plants and and herbs that she practices with, which of course is fantastic in some respects because you know it's very very helpful to the people of the local community to have a healer in their midst. But when James comes to the throne such people are viewed with deep suspicion because um, nearly all of those accused of witchcraft are healers. And so, of course, it immediately puts Frances in the frame, particularly as she gets a, a job at court in the household of the king's daughter, Elizabeth. So she's right in the heart of it, in the heart of politics, right under the king's nose, and yet she can't resist continuing to practice her healing, which of course puts her in great danger. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and so did you know from book one where you were going? Obviously, this is based on a real character. So there are some, as you, ex, you described, that there was some kind of framework to her story. Yes. But did you know yes. where you were going with this story and what you wanted to see happen with her character? Or, or did it... Did it did it kind of unfold itself as you yes. got into her, inhabited her world? Um, and basically, I'm going to be, give a really annoying uh, historian's <laughs> answer and sit on the fence and say a bit of both. But <laughs> I knew the overarching story arc when I began. And, and let me just say, it is a trilogy. When I first conceived it, it was six books. Um, and, you know, never say never. Let's just say I've, I've left a door open <laughs> at the uh-huh. end of book three. Ah. Um, so I knew the overarching narrative. But um, when, I be- when I write um, fiction and I start each chapter, I don't know where it's going to go. And that is both scary and liberating. Um, and, I, and it's amazing what occurs to you. If you just let your mind be free and you just write, you kind of know the vague direction uh, but if you just if you just write and just let ideas occur to you, various different twists and turns in the plot occurred to me as I went along. And actually, I think some of the best ones, uh, some of the, the best drama actually evolved rather than me starting out saying, right, and then that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is quite a it feels like a bit of a leap of faith sitting yeah. down to write fiction you're not quite sure where it's going to take you but it's also quite exciting that way yeah absolutely when when I wrote my fiction book what I found was um and I don't know whether you had the same experience but once you were in a scene with a character it was almost as if they told you what they want what what yes. was supposed to happen next and it absolutely. was like oh, this is amazing <laughs> I know I know and and sometimes as well it was like um life imitating art in that you know I would write I'd write Francis into a scene um completely from imagination and then I would find something out that proved that's really close to what actually happened Uh, and then you get the kind of shivers down your spine Mm -hmm. and you think is she is she somehow there on my shoulder Mm -hmm. telling me you know now do this because that's what I did Um, and and I love that because of course more than anything I want to do justice to her she is well she was a, a real person and I don't want to just play, play completely fast and loose with her life, you know, as, as much as I can, I want to be faithful to the historical facts. Yeah. And I just I just noticed somebody who was coming to late to the talk saying what books have been discussed and and somebody Anna has kindly replied. But just in case people are coming, we're talking about your trilogy set largely in the 17th century in the Tudor uh, era. And um, this involves and I'll just show the three books again for people who may be coming. The King's Witch, The Devil's Slave and your up and coming book, I believe, The Fallen Angel. So uh, hopefully, yes. So I just put that on the screen. So hopefully anybody joining late will know what we are talking about. Now, I want to go to a question that came in on Twitter, actually, during the week. And that came from Bev L. I don't know whether Bev L is is in the house right now, but um, here we go with Bev's question. Uh, I, I love the way you write fiction around real people and real events. How did the research for the trilogy differ from the research from your non-fiction books? And how difficult was it to avoid blurring the lines between fact and fiction? Ha, that's a great question. Well, in terms of the research and how it differed, what I would say is for fiction, you do a lot more social history research because even just writing a sentence like, um, I don't know, Francis took a sip of, of wine, um, would she have been drinking wine? Would she have used a glass? Would it have been a goblet? You know, all of those details in order to get the authenticity across, you need to, to research those, the, the sort of mannerisms, the the etiquette, the fact that if you're married, you you don't call your spouse by their Christian name. Uh, you, you address them very formally. And, and all of that, that sort of thing was it was fascinating, actually. Um, I really, really enjoyed that side of it. So I think it helps to write fiction knowing the broad historical framework, because, of course, otherwise you'd have a whole lot more research <laughs> yeah. to do if you're having to look into the characters and the timeline, whereas I sort of had a fairly solid basis in that, thanks to my book on the witch hunts, mm-hmm. but it was the social history side. I almost couldn't write any sentence without doing some research um, but I learned a great deal, and particularly about herbal remedies and 
what surprised me was how effective some of them were. You tend to think about these weird and wonderful potions, but these wise women knew a thing or two about yeah. what worked. Yeah. So the second part of the question was about sort of blurring the lines. And, you know, sometimes I did actually confuse myself and thought something was real because it felt so real. Like you were saying, when you're writing fiction, it becomes so real to you. And then when I, I always do an author's note at the end of my fiction books, um, it's something I look out for when I'm reading novels. I always want to know what really happened. And I have to really remind myself, hang on, no, that was fiction. <laughs> and, uh, I do, and this I is where I, I kind of uh, strayed from the, from the known facts. And so there is sometimes a blurring. But the best um, thing is when there's an absolute gift of a real character a real event and particularly with the final book in the trilogy the fallen angel goodness me i had a ready-made gift-wrapped villain in the form of the duke of buckingham with him you really couldn't make it up i was going to ask you kind of who was your i wouldn't say favorite but you know who was the most intriguing complex gritty character maybe you want to talk a little bit about him then <laughs> yes i think it has to be buckingham i, I i've had very so book one really the villain is is robert cecil i mean james is sort of the long-running villain throughout james the first Book one, Robert Cecil. Book two, Prince Henry, um, the short-lived uh, eldest son and heir of James I, the man who would have been king. And book three, it's the Duke of Buckingham. Well, what <laughs> a character. In, on the one hand, incredibly charismatic, charming, very good-looking, you know, strikingly handsome. But on the other, um, heart, complete heart of a devil, face of an angel. Um, he was nicknamed by the king Steeny because he looked like St. Stephen, who was said to have angelic features. Mm -hmm. So he was beautiful to look at, but it really concealed this dark-hearted villain. He was ruthlessly ambitious. Woe betide anybody who um, got in his way, as my heroine does, and her family, uh, in book three. But um, James was completely head over heels in love with him from the moment he met him and therefore Buckingham had this inexorable rise at the Stuart court and became the most powerful but also the most hated man in England and so you can imagine what fun I had with him. Absolutely goodness me and this is all this is basically this is a real person and this is really how he behaved. Yes and some of the the best scenes are, are real. And I had to actually put little editorial notes for, what, for when I submitted it to my publisher. I, I kept putting footnotes saying, this actually happened. You know, I haven't just gone off on one and <laughs> I've made up something really bizarre. Th this was real. Um, and, you know, they, they were the nuggets when I was doing the research and, and finding out. And actually, one of the the real nuggets, uh, without giving too much away, is that um, at one stage, Buckingham was actually accused um, quite strongly of poisoning uh, the king. And a whole book has been written, a non-fiction book has been written, uh, kind of strongly suggesting that he really may have tried to poison the king. So oh. that was something I definitely uh, had some fun with. Well, that's interesting. We've got a couple, obviously, the, you're not alone in your interest of the Duke, because we've had a couple of people leave a couple of comments. So Silkwell and Cottontails, hello there, says, the Duke, was he really such a handsome man? Do you know which artist painted him? And then we also have somebody uh, um, say, quite intrigued with the Duke of Buckingham. I'm very curious to know more. Uh, so, so yes, you're not, you're not alone. So, I, I, <laughs> but he was I a know. handsome man, clearly. He, he was. I mean, you can tell. Obviously, tastes have changed. Sometimes you look back at portraits, don't you, from the Tudor and Stuart era, and you think, really, were they considered? Good looking, particularly when you look at Henry's wives. I think you know tastes have changed. Yeah. He was considered beautiful, um, yeah. but you can see it. You can see it. He's got this uh, kind of dark eyes, very tall, slender. Um, Van Dyke painted him. Uh, he 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 was kind of real inspiration for a whole um, whole rash of of artists. Um, but undoubtedly, apart from his physical charms, he did have this kind of magnetic personality mm. he had charisma because he had self-confidence mm. in spades and it just drew people to him uh, but it, it kind of woe betide anyone who did get close to him because you might end up paying the price 
Well, there's another great question, I think, here from Beverly. I think she makes a great comment first and then she asks a question. So thank you for this, Beverly. I feel that these books would make a wonderful BBC drama series. Oh. I'm sure you wouldn't disagree. Uh, oh, certainly. <laughs> but, but the question is, is there any actor you would like to see bring any of your particular characters to life? Oh, gosh, that's a fantastic question. Um, if this is Beverly in Lincoln, by the way, hello, because um, she's a lovely lady and has been to some of my events. I don't know if it is, but I know you mentioned a Beverly from Lincoln at the beginning. So um, sending lots of love. Um Gosh, well, do you know what? I'm actually influenced by something that I've spent the past two days watching uh, with my daughter, um, who's 10. And I judged that she's just old enough for Colin Firth's Pride and Prejudice. And uh, we've been watching that. And so I'm kind of, I had Colin Firth in mind for the hero of book three, uh, who is uh, Sir Thomas Tyringham, uh, because, yeah, uh, he's a character who really appealed to me he was the king james's master of the buckhounds so he was really uh james's right hand man when he went hunting as the king did an awful lot um and i sort of had colin firth slash mr darcy in mind uh as i was writing it and in terms of francis my heroine i've always imagined her as gina mckee now I don't know if, if um, everyone listening, watching uh, will know who that is. I think she was in Our Friends in the North, kind of in the in the 90s, maybe. Beautiful. She was in Notting Hill, the film Notting Hill. Oh, uh-huh. Beautiful, dark haired. Um, that's that's kind of who I would cast as, as Frances. Um, okay. But, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure if she's still if she's still acting but in a sort of fantasy cast I would have her but yeah um it's I'm always influenced though when I see historical dramas and and you see who mm. is cast and then I think oh he would make a a good such and such and so um because I love Wolf Hall so much I've, I've imagined Mark Rylance in some of the roles as well I think it really helps doesn't it I know you know you you visualize the character and and of course you are influenced by popular culture and but I just do think it helps um do think it helps bring them to life uh for it sure does. yeah it so, really does it yeah no gone uh, by the way it was Bev, oh. <laughs> Bev. Hello, Bev. she said bless you thank you for remembering me so that is Beverly <laughs> Oxford bless your heart yes it's me so um, oh, there you are I like <laughs> so um do guys do keep asking your question we're getting lots of lots of people saying hello so i'll just um uh, so anna said colin and gina perfect and um um <laughs> I, is it paula paula um couldn't get agree more about colin firth um, <laughs> <laughs> um definitely colin firth says janet hardcastle so so i think you, right. you know you, you've got a posse there who are all all agreeing with Excellent. you oh that's <laughs> wonderful okay so do guys do keep asking your questions um if i've missed your question and it's kind of scrolled up to the top don't be afraid to write it again. I'm trying to keep an eye on things as they come through, but do keep asking. Um, so, look, witchcraft. Let's talk about witchcraft because this is such a, a central theme across the books here. So I guess the whole witchcraft thing was was all to do with Puritanism, but was there anything specifically that uh, influenced J- James to, to be so hardline on this? There was a defining moment for James in his belief in witches. Um, He'd been raised to believe in the existence of witchcraft. He was raised in a pretty much all-male household, and he was raised to have a very dim view of his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, whom some believed uh, was a witch. But all of that gave him an interest, but it deepened into an obsession thanks to an event in 1589. So that was the year that he was betrothed to Anne of Denmark. He was then just King of Scots. And following the betrothal, Anne made her way over uh, from Denmark, or she tried to, but her fleet of ships was battered back by a violent storm. And so she had to retreat to Denmark. Well, James decided he was going to very bravely go and get her. And he was going to collect her and escort her back to Scotland very chivalrous you don't often Mm. see that with James so he (laughs) set off in his fleet lo and behold another violent storm was whipped up seemingly out of nowhere several ships lost James almost lost his life 
eventually he makes it over to Denmark. Well, when he makes it to Denmark, he starts um, telling his um, the courtiers there of his adventures. And Denmark is at the forefront of the witch hunts at this time. And he meets some leading witch hunters who say, you know, neither of these storms were accidental. You have been bewitched. Somebody is trying to bewitch you and your new queen um, and and to murder you, really, to, to make you your fleet sink uh, in the North Sea. And James was utterly convinced, so much so that as soon as they finally made it over to Scotland, he had no fewer than 100 people arrested on suspicion of a witchcraft conspiracy. Wow. And from that moment on, really, he is obsessed. Mm. He writes a whole book on the subject, Demonology. It becomes a bestseller of its day, published in 1597. And really, this is James presenting his case for why witchcraft exists and why it needs to be completely wiped off the face of the earth and he believes that god has placed him on the earth to get rid of witches uh, he is so obsessed from wow. that moment forward a total zealot for, to, oh, yeah. absolutely he doesn't do anything by halves You're right but what you find i think somebody said that james's passions burnt brightly but briefly usually so he becomes very very obsessed with things because he, he's a great intellectual you tend to forget that about james he's he's exceptionally intelligent um but usually he becomes really interested in something and then oh that's it bored now on to the next thing right. but which is is the obsession that endures really throughout his life yes okay and we've got a couple of questions a little bit a couple more questions around that so uh, was witchcraft more present in scotland and were many mm. wise women executed there Yes, yes to both of those things. It was absolutely more prevalent in Scotland uh, than in England. In fact, we'd sort of had our peak of witch hunting by the time James came to the throne. Mm. Elizabeth I, God bless her, wasn't that interested in hunting down witches. Um, but uh, it, it was still going very much strong in, in Scotland, where they burned witches. Uh, we hanged which is here so you might say it's more humane but um mm. but then of course everything changes with with james as king of england as well as scotland suddenly of course all his new subjects are racing to flatter him by imitation and to pretend that they share his obsession so you see this huge upsurge in witch hunting in England after 1603, when he is king here. And that's why you get the likes of Shakespeare writing Macbeth, uh, the famous witch play, mm -hmm. in order to, to curry favour with the new king. And my favourite bit of trivia is Shakespeare made Macbeth shorter than his other plays because he knew that the king didn't really like the theatre. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Again, it sounds like this was a man who lacked attention in some yes. ways, isn't it? <laughs> like you get with lots of kind of dictators, short attention spans, yeah. uh, and then on to the next thing. Well, again, we've so uh, an interesting sort of sidestepping questioning here, again, from Silkworm and Cottontails. Thank you very much. How do you think James really felt about English, the English characters that he must have known had a hand in his mother's death? Did he yeah. ever take direct action against them? Not really. And I have to say, there's very little evidence that he felt anything particularly negative towards them. I think, as I mentioned, he'd been raised to pretty much despise his mother. Mm. Um, he never really knew her. He was just really a baby um, mm. when, when she fled to England. And so he was raised by those very hostile to Mary. So from infancy, uh, he was taught to hate his mother. And you don't really get any differing view from that. He very quickly forgave Elizabeth. Uh, for ordering her execution and there's no evidence that he really saw any kind of retribution uh, once he was king of England so I think that early view that was indoctrinated in him really stuck throughout his life. I suppose the only thing that's occurring to me now is why did he bother bringing her to Westminster Abbey? Was It was him, wasn't it? Who, it yes, it was. I yeah. know, to be fair, he did do that. You know, she, <laughs> she was kind of buried with greater style and, uh, you know, a, a, but, but that was really expected. It's for form's mm, sake. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure how genuine uh, that was on, on James's part, but he was conscious that 
he had to be seen to honour his late mother, but nothing else he did suggest that he really felt any kind of attachment to her. Yeah, yeah. So just for almost for the sake of appearances, it was the it was the done thing. The done thing, yeah. exactly. And Anna's Anna's just making a point. You have to wonder how someone as intelligent as and and religious as James would believe in the existence of witches. Mm. Do you think he was just beguiled by those around him? Yeah, although obviously it it can be hard because we're looking at it with a 21st century mind. So we think, of course, it's ridiculous. But this is an age of of superstition where where people don't understand as much about the world as we do today. And so when there are natural um, phenomena or sudden deaths in a community or crop failure, people don't have a good explanation. So they tend to assign it to some kind of mystical forces Mm -hmm. and People, even, you know, great intellectuals very much believe um, in in this sort of mystical world where there are there were kind of sprites and goblins and evil forces and spells um, and even the so-called intellectuals of the day. So I think it, it can be really hard to get into that mindset um, and actually think, no, this was very, very real to people um, because they didn't have a means of explaining things otherwise. And I think the other thing that I found particularly challenging is to really get into the 17th century mindset in terms of religion. You know, people lived or died for this, for mm. their faith and the Catholics in particular. You look at what they went through because it was so important to them and and you know it really was because quite often you see people on trial for for catholicism or uh, papism as it was known and you think why don't they just say okay yeah no sorry i was wrong i'm going to convert to the official protestant faith but it meant so much to people um and you really have to put yourself in those in, in in their kind of mindset i think yeah, and it is so difficult for us, isn't it, to for for most people today when we live in this secular society, largely speaking, to to understand how somebody could be prepared to walk into the flames. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. When you look at what lay ahead, I mean, it was utterly terrifying, mm. but people were so passionate about it. Yeah. So somebody was asking about the debauchery at court. <laughs> Good. like a bit of debauchery. Yes, why afternoon. not? Um, <laughs> not sure we're quite after the watershed, but hey ho. Um, so yes, yeah, so w- 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 how? What? 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 What yeah. was? What was going on? That was. Okay, so the, it was going on both at a general level in court, but also specifically within the royal household. Um, so um, there was a huge upsurge in uh, prostitution at court um, because. You know, as I was saying earlier, it's no longer strictly controlled and there's no emphasis on morality anymore. Um, J- James isn't bothered about any of that. So there's prostitution. There are, There's lots of um, affairs going on. I mean, court always, always has been a sort of hotbed of mm. sex and scandal to some extent, but it had been a little bit behind closed doors. It now all came out into the open. But of course, the greatest scandal was James's own love life, even though on the one hand, he's a respectable married man. He has three children by Anne of Denmark when he is king of England, when he becomes king of England. Uh, so appearance wise fantastic you know there's no question over the succession mm-hmm. unlike in the virgin queen's reign but on the other on the other hand james has this weakness for handsome young men and he surrounds himself with them spends a great deal of time alone uh with his male favorites now there may have been nothing more than companionship but there is quite compelling evidence i think that he was at least bisexual Mm -hmm. if not homosexual Mm -hmm. um and uh, and we know that he and buckingham for example shared a bed from the the very earliest days of uh buckingham's relationship uh with james whatever form that took so this was just deeply shocking it's not shocking today it really was shocking in the 17th century particularly as it involved the king so it excited an awful lot of gossip but also an awful lot of hostility towards the new king it was all just a bit too much Mm. for the courtiers who'd been used to the virgin queen you couldn't get more different (laughs) it's just talk and cheese isn't it 
um, w- 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 there's a little bit of lag I know in the kind of the t- in the in the conversation that comes through for folks. So I'm um, I'm kind of looping back a little bit with sure. the question because we we've got another question this time from um, oh uh, by the way that was Gary who asked the question. Um, so thanks oh, for that, Gary. Gary. And now we have Bruce asking: Did the Pendle witches in Lancashire play any part in your background research? Uh, taking place in 1612 it would have been early in James's reign that's right yes they did indeed and um, particularly in book two the devil's slave um, that featured because um, there had been a bit of a downturn in witch hunting after the first rush um, when James James became king of England and then it sort of petered out a bit but the Pendle witchcraft case was so notorious that then you see an upsurge again uh, in witch hunting and it happens at just the wrong moment for my heroine uh, in book two for the spotlight again to be on her as this woman renowned as a, as a healer. So yes I did do research into the Pendle uh, witchcraft case which was quite extraordinary and of course involved uh, quite a few different suspected witches of both sexes actually um, and that's the one that's really gone down in history but I would just like to make a plea for recognition of another witchcraft case that uh, certainly features uh, in my trilogy you would expect nothing less of a Lincoln lass as I am because this trial culminated in Lincoln and it involved the witches of Beaver or it's spelt Belvoir Mm. Castle Mm -hmm. Um, but they were accused of bewitching the two young sons of the Earl of Rutland to death. And let's just say there was a good deal more to that case than met the eye. And that is one of the central themes of the third and final book. And the case actually came to embroil the Duke of Buckingham himself. And that's not fiction. It's It was one of the most spine-tingling moments when I was researching it to Ooh. come across his potential role in all of that. Ooh. So without giving all the whole game away, I think we should start to talk about your final book because it isn't out yet, is it? It's coming no. out soon. Thanks to COVID, uh, it's not <laughs> out yet. It was going to be out last month, but actually I'm quite pleased about the new publication date because it's the 5th of November. Oh. So, you know, it's kind of appropriate given the overall theme of the uh, of the trilogy. So do you what can you what can you tell us about it without giving the game away wet everybody's appetite? So it the the plot opens in 1614 so pretty much where book 2 uh, left off and it it opens really uh, with James's first first meeting with the Duke of Buckingham when he first claps eyes on him uh, whilst he's visiting um, Apethorpe um in Northamptonshire and and it's all the drama that there thereafter um unfolds now my heroine um Frances she's now kind of she starts the novel in her um late 30s and then it, it kind of follows her it, the novel spans the rest of James's reign so it covers about 10 10 or 11 years and so it follows her and her family's varying fortunes um and buckingham soon has her card marked uh, she crosses him early on and really he is the central character in all of this mm-hmm. and just the the devastation that he wreaks on all of those around him but in particular on francis um and so yeah that that's the without giving it's hard to know oh, yes. <laughs> how much else to say without kind of giving too much away but it's yeah it's the last 10 years of james's reign well, I, I, again, if if we're giving too much away, you're going to have to say no. I can't go there. <laughs> but I know when you write, when you tend to write a book, there's usually the and you've just alluded to something. That's why I'm digging a little bit. See so if I can w- p- winkle anything else <laughs> out. Um, you know, there's usually a, a research moment where it's just like you say. It's like it's kind of your favourite research moment where the pieces of the jigsaw suddenly come together, or you you see something that you hadn't seen before, and it, and it yes. kind of yeah you had that moment clearly oh gosh i did i did have that moment and and it was around um it was actually regarding the the beaver witches and it was a sort of light bulb moment regarding the duke of buckingham's involvement in the case and what he stood to gain by making sure that those witches were hanged and that they were blamed for something that in fact he may have had more than a hand in and and it started as a dramatic device um, just for me, just thinking, well, why don't I make him responsible for this? And, and then he's trying to put the blame on these three poor women who who um, who were then hanged for their crime. 
But then I actually did some research around it and I thought, hang on a minute, that 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 kind of backs it up. And the, and and it started to be that that life imitating art thing again. And it was it was just r- remarkable. I mean, it, I ended up though completely blurring the lines for myself and being utterly convinced of his guilt. Uh, but as a historian, I have to say that the evidence is just circumstantial. But you know, it does make an intriguing case. Mm. What happened to this? Just because I mean, just I'm just really intrigued and I really don't know the history. What happened to this guy, the Duke of the Buckingham? The oh, of... gosh. Well, this is a story. In the end, what, what what happened? Did he have a sticky end? Tell me he had a sticky he end. He had a sticky end because I mentioned <laughs> not only by the um, end of James's reign, he is he's certainly the most powerful man in England, but he's the most reviled. You know, he has upset an awful lot of people along the way. He's seen as arrogant and overstepping the mark. Um, and and he he gets his comeuppance in the next reign, in the reign of James's son Charles the uh, First, when he is assassinated. Um, so he is uh, assassinated by a kind of disgruntled uh, member of his army, because Buckingham by then is leading military campaigns a lot, and uh, somebody that he's passed over for promotion, uh, a man named John Felton. Uh, ass- assaults uh, Buckingham when he's staying at an inn in Portsmouth gathering a new expedition to France and he emerges from the inn and Felton uh, stabs him through the heart and that's it that is the end of Buckingham oh, he wow. comes to a very a very sticky is it harsh to say well-deserved end mm. but uh, yeah, yeah his life is cut very short <laughs> No love lost there. Now let's um let's go back and see if we've got some other questions here because there have been some folk. Um, let me see. Okay, so Derek's asking. Hi, Tracy. In the trilogy, James is viewed as a villain. What is your personal view of his legacy? Were there any positive aspects to his reign? Do you feel? Hmm. Well, hi, Derek. Thank you for that um, question. Absolutely. There were positive aspects. I think that James really built on um, Elizabeth's religious settlement. He tried to make it a little bit more resolved than Elizabeth had left it. Much as I love Elizabeth, she is my favourite of all uh, historical uh, uh, characters. Um, But she did leave some loose ends with regard religion because she didn't like to you know, make windows into men's souls. But that meant that there were still these divisions between the Catholics and the Protestants. And James went further and he tried to resolve things. There was the famous Hampton Court Conference early in his reign. And I think James's legacy was to bring issues out into the open. And this was a very Scottish tradition. The Scots liked to debate. They liked to have their two penneth worth. um, And the English were much more reserved and not used to this. But actually, it was what was needed in religion. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, James didn't permanently resolve uh, the religious issues. They were still bubbling away in the reign of his son, uh, Charles. But he, he certainly went further, I think, than Elizabeth um, Mm. had gone. And James was also a great peacemaker. He was very sensible in foreign policy. I always get quite frustrated with these warfaring kings and their excruciatingly expensive campaigns that achieve nothing. But James was much more sensible. And so he'd achieved relative stability for England um, overseas, which did last a little while. So it, it, and also, I suppose, you know, he's the first king of a united kingdom. And even though he didn't quite make England and Scotland as closely united as he hoped, he'd laid the foundations uh, for our modern day United Kingdom. Right, thank you for that. And um, I just moving on to actually a very different topic now. Um, CW is asking, who's your favorite historical novelist? Oh gosh. And maybe oh, the why? Choice. <laughs> the choice, the choice. Um, I've, I've just finished, um, for the second time, Hilary Mantel's final uh, oh. tome, uh, The Mirror and the Light. Absolutely extraordinary. I'm a huge, huge fan of Alison Weir, mm-hmm. um, both as a historian and as a novelist. And her Six Wives series mm-hmm. is just exceptional. Um, I think C.J. Sansom, actually... If I'm really, really pushed, I just love his Shard Lake 
novels. Uh, I think Shard Lake himself is an absolute, he's a wonderful character. He's almost an anti-hero. Um, and the way that Sanson brings the period to life, I think is just exceptional. So mm. he would probably just about uh, get out in front, but oh, there are so many to choose from. That's wonderful. And I'm just that's just checking um, if we've got any other questions coming through here. Uh, so C- CW is, is saying so with you on that. Um, and Karen, <laughs> excellent series. So yeah, thank you. Some other uh, fans out there. That's yeah, good. definitely other fans out there. So I do, I am noticing the time and I want to just bring us back to, to, you know, First of all, I guess, you know, immediately what happens with The Fallen Angel? When can we expect to see it? And, yes. you know, what's going to be happening? You're going to be doing any events around that? Yes. Well, I hope so. Um, mm. Now, you see, with a heavy heart, I can sort of, I, I looked in my diary for Monday and I was supposed to be launching it at the Tower of London to uh, mm. members of Historic World Palaces. So that gave me a bit of a pang. <laughs> like, oh. yeah. um, now, I'm going to be doing some online um, events. I've got a couple of um, a sort of virtual literary festivals um, in the autumn, and I am going to be updating my website with with details of those. But as you can imagine, the the actual events that I had in my diary, most of them have been postponed uh, to next year. But I'm hoping to do as many of these kind of online chats. And so, thank you for being yes. actually probably the first. I was <laughs> going to say one of the first. You are the first one. You know, this is the first one about the fallen angel. Oh, okay. um, the proofs are going to be out really soon. The the I, I, the US proofs are, uh, are being sent out for review as we speak, and the UK ones are going to be sent out very very soon. Um, so you know maybe we ought to kind of come up with a a competition or something. We could give away uh, a proof or two uh, through through your oh that would be uh, good activity. That might, that might be something nice to do. Um, Let, let's get our heads and, together afterwards and yes. see what we can concoct. So stay tuned, guys. Um, probably make sure that you're subscribed to my blog www.thetudortravelguide.com because anything I do definitely gets posted out through there. So if you want more information on this, whatever it is we concoct. <laughs> We'll think of something. You to tune in. But also, I just want to mention that I have put a link to your website in Thank the description you. below this video. So, guys, you should be able to see it there. I think it's tracyborman.co.uk. Is That's that right? right? Yeah. That's it. So um, you, you can um, keep up to date with what Tracy's doing and, and events and so on by, by tuning in there. So that's good. So the date for launch then is when can people be expecting so to The arrive? 5th of November. 5th, nice, that's right. easy day to remember. It so is. bonfire night. Excellent. There you go. Very appropriate. It really is, isn't it? That's wonderful. I love it. And what's next? You were hinting at one or two little things in the writing yes. pipeline. Can you give anything away? Either either yes. writing or maybe on TV? <laughs> yes. Well, um, let's start with the latter because I have just restarted um, Inside the Tower of London. It's series three. It's been really popular, really good. Um, which we're delighted about. I do this as part of my work for Historic Royal Palaces. And the tower has just reopened as well. So it's all very exciting. So next week, I'm going to be spending spending a lot of time at the tower um, and there's such a, a choice of stories you know even three series in we've got so many stories still to tell Excellent. and I think next week's activity I'm talking about the downfall of Catherine Howard and of Bishop Fisher Ooh. so two very different Ooh. characters um, in terms of writing um, I am back to the non-fiction for the next two books and all I can say is thank goodness for lockdown because I have to admit, Sarah, I was falling behind uh, <laughs> thanks to getting distracted by TV and various things. But now I am back on course um, and I'm very excited to say my next non-fiction is A History of the Monarchy. Oh, wow. And so the biggest book I have ever Ooh. written, a thousand years um, of uh, royal history um, in Britain and it has been such a journey already I can tell you that I've got as far as Charles II uh, that's who I'm writing about at the moment but what a journey and 
what characters and drama and goodness me it's given me some inspiration for future books as well i bet you must be overflowing with inspiration and ideas and facts you're sort of so many walking many even even beyond the tudors although of course that was my favorite section but you know even even beyond those so many so many great characters and events that uh, that i could either write about fiction uh, in a fiction context or or non-fiction Oh, that sounds wonderful. So we just have to enjoy the novels and then be patient and enjoy you on TV <laughs> in the meantime. And um, yeah, I so I mean, I think then is there anything else we need to know? Um, because Gosh, I, anything else, anything um, else you'd like to tell everybody about or update? I would, people I would on? also like to just mention in terms of um, historic royal palaces, because the Tower series has been so popular, I'm really excited to say that they've branched out and they're also doing a series on Hampton Court mm-hmm. and a series on Kensington Palace. Okay. So, both the same sort of thing where you kind of get inside mm-hmm. the palace, you see how it operates, who works there, visitors coming to it, but also you look at the history and some of the personalities from the history of those two palaces and I'm involved in in both and and so that's a real joy actually because much as I love the tower you know the other palaces have got a fascinating history uh to tell as well and so um, I'm really really looking forward to to finishing uh that filming this autumn and um, there's also something coming up in September, which I am enormously excited about because it's my new TV series. It's for Channel 5 and it's The Fall of Anne Boleyn. And this series looks at the last um, few days of her life, really, from her arrest through to her execution, but in a very forensic, almost hour by hour accounts. And looking at Anne's downfall in that way is something I've never done. Mm. And all sorts of revelations appeared. It was quite extraordinary. It's like when you look Mm. at it like that and set aside knowing what's going to happen, you see it all in a completely different light. And I learned so much about Anne. Um, It was a joy to make. Um, That's due on our screens in September. Well, that's fantastic because that's not long to wait. So um, (laughs) I'm going to be really really looking forward to that that's wonderful well thank you for sharing all that and and i think before you go we should just share a few comments that people have been um so let me just pick at at random there's been so many here uh to me thank you very much for this monica thank you very much i've enjoyed this talk brilliant anna yippee i love that tv series that's i think you're um inside the tower maybe oh yes Yeah. yeah um um, thank you so much. Heartfelt greetings from Italy. Um, Helen went to the tower today and it was great. It must be. Oh, I bet great. it. I bet because it, all of them are just reopening now, aren't they? So yes, you they can are. actually get in. Um, and uh, Anna said, "Oh my God, a tome on the way." Smiley face. I think. <laughs> <laughs> It is indeed a tome. <laughs> and and actually somebody said, do you know if these TV series are available in the US? Maybe you can answer that. Yeah, I know that there are plans for them to be. So the Tower um, series, um, I think it's, it's going to be, hopefully, uh, there's a broadcaster that's going to be showing it in the US. There might be a slight delay, mm. um, but certainly it will appear. I can say for definite the Hampton Court series is going to be showing in the US. No dates as yet, but um, I will certainly be posting about that. That's great. That's great. And I, I, and there's so many more, um, so many more comments. Thank you both from Bruce, Gillian. Thank you, Sarah and Tracy. Very enjoyable. And uh, Karen, thank you, Sarah and Tracy. It's been amazing. And that's from North that's California nice. in US. I'm a oh big... Oh my God, this is what blows my mind when you see the global (laughs) kind of engagement in this i cannot get my head around this there are people kind of you know posting from italy america germany all over australia and you think wow that is what a global community we are it's a great community um it's a what the the tudor sphere i think is amazing and it's been a wonderful place i think where people, like-minded people, have been able to come together through these difficult times and just immerse themselves in something that is just just thoroughly in sort of passion, you know, is a passion for people. And um, 
I think I think a lot of people have found great solace in that. So um, anyway, I think we need to draw our chat to a close. We've kept you here for too long. <laughs> We're just coming up to Cold an hour. Beer waiting for me. Our post ride beer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I just thank you so much. Um, it's been such a pleasure to chat and. Um, yeah guys the book's gonna be out soon so and there's so much from tracy coming our way so let's look out for that so thank you thank you tracy it's been fantastic thank you i have had an absolute ball it's been such a delight to talk to you and to, to respond to all the questions okay thank you and um folks um i just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on today. We've had loads of people online and thank you so much for all your comments and your questions and your thumbs up and your hearts. That's really wonderful. And so I just wanted to remind you all of that, um, well, a couple of things, first of all. Next week, Live at Five will be coming from my Facebook group, which is the Tudor Travel Show Hitting the Road. So if you're not already uh, a member of that group, you can just search for it on Facebook, request access, and then you will be able to join in the live streams what I tend to do is uh, of uh, three live streams on Facebook per month and then want you to talk with a guest here on YouTube so make sure you don't miss out on the Facebook chats and as I was saying of course as well you can subscribe to my blog at www.thetudortravelguide.com and that's packed full of goodies about Tudor places and artifacts things to see and places to go so do subscribe to my newsletter and of course make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel which is somewhere a button around here somewhere um, you should be able to subscribe and uh, there's plenty of new material coming your way here okay so um thank you so much and I hopefully will see you guys live at five on my Facebook group next week okay Thanks for joining. Bye.